Hello friends. So we are discussing post-colonial writings. Cutting models, cutting the ground, critical models of post-colonial literatures. So we have seen uh, what are the special qualities, characteristics of post-colonial writings. Then we saw four major models, national and regional one. Second, we saw the comparative models, now. the wider comparative models, and black, black, white, white, black and white. <laughs> yes. And then we saw the third race-based models or black writing models, and also negritude. What is meant by negritude? Negritude is the black writing that is their special qualities distinctive qualities of black writing, especially more emotional. Uh, they look at things as a whole and there is a rhythm, very much importance is given to rhythm, rhythm and there are concept called soul, means repetition you know, in, uh, in music, so it's a repetition. And uh, we also said that this was a great movement by the black writers and uh, it influenced writers in America like Langston Hughes and Richard Wright and so on. Now we must understand that there are also several other models. So several other models of uh, post-colonial uh, writings. Post-colonial, how to approach post-colonial writings develops. One of these is 1965. D.E.S. Maxwell's model. D.E.S. D.E.S. Maxwell. That was in 1965. Now, this model actually, it is uh, built around language and uh, place. Language and place. Language and place. You can see throughout this post-colonial writings, when we study post-colonial writings, you will see that this dialect between language and place you will find. Now what does this language and place mean? It's about disjunction, disjunction. That is the phrase that is, that is the word that you should use. Disjunction between language and place. Separation between language and place. The language here is English, you know. Language when we say that is English language. So, English language, and uh, for this, Maxwell says, place and displacement. Is it? Place and displacement is a major concern, a major theme in the post-colonial writings. So also the distinction between place and language in separation. As we have seen, uh, the, the central problem or you can see the central idea that is discussed is questioning the appropriate suitability of an important language to describe the experiences of place in post-colonial studies. So that is questioning the appropriateness of an important language, which is the suitability of the important language. Whether an important language can describe the experiences of a place in post-colonial studies. Understand? For example, what is this important language that is English? Now he, he, a foreign language, a foreign language to an alien place. You are taking a language to another place, isn't it? And therefore he says, whether it is possible to describe the experiences of a, a place, a new place, with this language. That is the question that they are discussing. Now here you see, you can see there are the Maxwell uh, groups, these post-colonial uh, countries into two. There are two groupings. One is settler colonies. Settler colonies. Settler colonies. And the second is invaded colonies. Invaded colonies. So in the first 
category you have got America, you have Canada, you have New Zealand, and you have Australia. It's simpler colonies. So what happened there, you know? Um, people from England or other parts of Europe, they uh, landed in these places, America, etc. With them they carried their language. So what happened is that they, they, they brought their language, the settlers' language to an alien country. Was the settlers, they had their original language, but they had their mother tongue with them. They came and they settled. And they, uh, they, they somehow managed to displace all the natives from that place. And they went into the uh, border areas or border hills and after some time they, they, they disappeared. Isn't it? So what happens is that the country, they took over the country, they settled there, they brought their language with them. This, is, this happened in America, Australia, Canada and New Zealand and they started using this, their language to describe places and experiences in an alien land. So here you understand the settlers, they had their language. They had the mother tongue with them, but they came to a different place. And uh, since they had no tradition to look up to, no tradition to draw from, they thought that this language is enough for them. They fully believed in the adequacy of this language, the language that they brought with them to describe the experiences that they have on the, of the land, the landscape, of the uh, atmosphere or the environment and, and so on. So they have no question about that. So on seasons and then uh, different uh, features of the land, hill, river and so on. So then what happened is uh, a small hill or a mountain or a valley. So these are different uh, uh, things that we find in the landscape. So they thought that they gave names to them. They just don't bother, did not bother about the names already existing, but they just gave names. Like New Jersey, see that? And then uh, uh, in America, for example. So you have got such kind of names. They gave, and they uh, fully believed that whatever we do is right. That's the thing. They, they have no question, they have no doubt about it. Because they fully believed in the efficiency or the suitability of the language that they brought with them to describe these experiences. For so it was all right, it's a monolingual. Language, on the basis of language, if you say, the settler societies or settler colonies were monolingual. Because they are competition for them. Understand? So the settler uh, colonies were, you can say, monolingual. Now what is the what about the invader colonies? The invader colonies, um, foreign, they brought a foreign language to a native land or indigenous land and indigenous people. For the English, they brought to India. India is an example for that. Or Nigeria is an example for that. So here what happened is the language is foreign, but the writer's place is his own. For the writer, in this India for example, an Indian writing in English, language is foreign, but his land is his own. His land is indigenous to him. His land is his native land. Settler colonies is not the same. It is not the case. Settler colonies, language is their own, writer's language, but the land is alien. But in invaded colonies like India, language is foreign, and the land is the writer's own land, the writer's own native land. So there is a kind of, you can say, uh, the language, the situation, the, ling the linguistic situation, you can say is bilingual. Here it is bilingual. But here it is, settler colonies is monolingual. So what happened there is that uh, this writers in bilingual countries, that is, uh, uh, that is India and uh, uh, Nigeria and so on, they, they could choose. They could write in their own language, mother tongue, or they could write in English, a foreign language. The pro most probably, most of these writers, as you can see, 
they prefer a foreign language because they thought that they will have a wider world view when you write a wider reception when you write in English language. So this is the situation in settler problems. But all these post-colonial societies, where you had monolingual, whether it was monolingual or bilingual, you had the problem. But that the wrestle, the wrestling with the words and meanings. If you take or, or you can say what is the what is the difficulty in expressing a certain uh, certain ideas concepts in the language either brought with them or in this uh, settler or in English. So you can say it's in English. You can say. in this case it's in English. See for example uh, you, you you can see in Indian uh, bakshish for example something uh, something new to the uh, the English people bakshish. Or when you are writing bakshish, so suppose you are using that particular word, you can say it's a tip, but the tip and bakshish both are different. Or sannyasi, for example. Maybe the English people they have no idea about sannyasi. It's after coming here, they found out the sannyasis and temples and so on. So I will, I will write this in English express that idea. It can be Englishmen or it can be Indians writing is in English. It's, it, it may, they may find it difficult. This is what is, that is what is meant by saying, wrestle with the words and meaning. Wrestling, you know, so wrestle with words and fighting, so to say. So if they find it difficult. Or you can see now, writers like Rudyard Kipling, they use the Hindi word for, Hindi word in their English writing. For example, they put some maja into it, man. Maja, maja means what? <laughs> some pleasure, some fun or some enjoyment. But the maja, the particular word maja, you can translate it in like the, the, like the enjoyment, the pleasure and so on, but maja is not pleasure and maja is not a enjoyment. It is something more or it is something less. So, very difficult to find out exact words to describing the Indian feelings. So, guru for example, guru. American, the English people don't know guru, they are only master. So master and guru both are totally different, isn't it? But you can use it for that. That's what the difficulty in it. Most of the place names, for example, our present Mumbai, for them it was Bombay. See this? Uh, our present uh, Kaligat, that, that was, they named it as Kalkatha. Kalkatha. <laughs> so the difference you can find. So this is what is meant by saying, wrestle with words and the meanings. So, the picture is like this. D.S. Maxwell's model it examines how a foreign language or an imported language could express the meanings or the experience of, or experiences of persons or writers in a foreign land. So in one case, settler colonies you find language is their own, writers own language, but the land is different. And in invader colonies, you know, writers' language is foreign, but the land is their own. That is the situation. And in any case, you will find this wrestling with meanings, uh, words and meanings. Wrestling with, I am using that because this is the word used in the text itself. So, and, and I also found that it's very good, no? uh, that it's a kind of metaphor use. So, if we find it is better to say, it is better than saying that. It was very difficult for these writers to uh, give exact meaning to use words to describe exact meaning or experience of experiences of their land and their uh, environment. Instead of that, you can say wrestling. I hope you don't have any objections, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. So here, what again? So this is the summary of what uh, D. S. Maxwell says. But there are two points of criticism. One is that. It is not sufficiently comprehensive. Comprehensive means all the colonies or all the post colonies societies you cannot bring under this model. There are two post colonial societies, uh, particularly that you can see. One is here, yeah, is the West Indian experience, West Indians, and B. South African, South African. So this is one criticism. Criticism, by one point of criticism, there is no comprehensive. 
Because in West Indies, West Indian situation, in West Indies, the situation was totally different. Right? You know the story of West Indies and colonization of, colonization of West Indies. After the landing of, within 100 years of the landing of the foreigners, foreigners in West Indies, all the natives, the Caribs and Arabs, they were totally exterminated. They said, they were so violent. The colonization in West Indies was violent. And it was so disruptive and subversive. Such a situation no one else will find. So that's one thing. And secondly, as I just now told you, after the within hundred years of the landing of the foreigners, and then uh, uh, there uh, they these uh, people, the native people, the Caribs and Arabs, Caribs, Arabs. They were exterminated. Not, not even a trace was found of the natives. It was so violent. And then some other groups were there. These groups they divided. And they carried all the men to work in the forcefully to work in the plantations. And they were asked to speak only in English. So English language actually was a language of disruption and division in the West Indies. Understand? So you cannot compare the West Indian situation with the Indian or with the American. That's what the, 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 the point that the, it is not comprehensive. Secondly, when you come to South Africa, you have got a South African white literature and South African black letters. South African white literature is, you have got all the characteristics of the settler colonies. Like America, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia. So, white literature. South African black literature has qualities of the African writings. Or black, black writing. And again, the whole thing is complicated because of the policy of the South African government. Apartheid. You know, you have come across this, no? Apartheid. Apartheid. So apartheid was like a vortex in which both South African white and South African black were drawn. So that again further complicated the matter. Understand? Therefore, you cannot say, and you know all these places you will find. In South African white, in black literature you will find uh, dispossession, cultural fragmentation, Colonial, neo-colonial fragmentation, cultural fragmentation, post-colonial corruption. This is what you find in uh, black writing. And this you will find in uh, the black South African literature also. At least some of this. Uh, a white, they always are there thinking about the exile, the problem of finding and finding and defining a home. Such things. They are the, these were the things. Physical and emotional confrontation with the, with the new atmosphere and so on. These are the things that you find in white. In black you have got something else, fragmentation and uh, disruption and all. In the other one it is searching, searching for an identity. So in both cases what happened? Identity was based on difference. There is a double vision against. This is what is called a double vision. Identity is constituted by or established by a difference. So in the settler colonies, identity is difference from the motherland or different from, from the land of their origin. Difference. National American, American literature is a national interest. It's not an English interest. So their identity is difference from that. And, uh, and what about the blacks? Again the same thing, difference. It can be either based on love or based on hatred. Whatever it is. But there is that double wish. I hope you understand. You are following me. Isn't it? Yes. So in this case what happens is, so apartheid again makes things complicated. Therefore, first point of criticism that is raised against D.E.S. Maxwell's model is that it is not sufficiently comprehensive. Means 
the west indian and the south africans they are outside this language place because it is not as simple as that language and place model it is not that simple a second and very important in fact in affecting all languages a second point is that uh, the question of adequacy of a language when it is transplanted to another place that's a major issue so according to maxwell maxwell says that maxwell's problem is that uh, if a language is taken from one place is place of origin taken to another place the language becomes inefficient so to say at least partially lame it's a lame duck because that language cannot properly exp describe experiences of the people there or experiences of the environment there this cannot be accepted it's a very simple and a simplistic and essential view of a language isn't it a language can be used only in its place of origin in that case imagine proto indo european today almost all the languages that we speak in asia and in europe they have descended from proto indo european the first form of the indo european family so in that case in people migrated to different places for because of many reasons it can be you now uh, this uh, what do you call that uh, wave theory and uh, pedigree theory the rogers glacier and then so on they uh, they gave us they explain this that how from the point where indo european originated the the speakers of the indo european they they migrated to different places they moved to different places carrying with them their language and then new languages developed from them so it see if you if you agree to this agree with this principle of a language can be used only in its place of origin you cannot even imagine of a post colonial literature because english can be used only in england but it is now being used in all over the world so maxwell's model you can you have to you stands or uh, there is no difference maxwell's model as far as uh, language the use of language is concerned cannot be defended for two reasons one as i already told you if a language can only be used in the in its place of origin then no other dialects no other forms of language will develop there's no possibility of such a development but already you have found there is a possibility that's why in the european we have got all the other languages the family secondly if you say that not you or me but maxwell says that a language is efficient the efficiency of the language is at least partially lost when it is transplanted to another place then there will be no possibility of a post colonial literature at all so maxwell stands to be to be sensible or you can say that this model has to be uh, it, it 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 attracts uh our criticism or at least our review no if not criticism at least our review the center so this is our language and place model proposed by ds maxwell stands so once again as a brief summary before i i before we say goodbye today the maxwell so there are several models Maxwell says another one, 1965 proposed. This is based on language and place. The central idea is that when you when a language is transported to another country, that is an alien country, then and to a, among an alien people, to an alien people, the language may not be in a position to, or it is inadequate, so to say, to describe the experiences and the places and uh, the environment uh, of that place language is not if not in the language of the land and uh, he groups the post the uh, the colonies into two settler colonies and uh, and uh, 
invader colonies. Settler colonies, you have the position is monolingual because settlers brought their language and they settled there and they start writing. Not that immediately after they land, they start writing. No, not that. Like literacy developed in that language. There's only one language and that is their language. But when the invader colonies, there are two languages because when the invaders come to that place, already there is a language existing, maybe a fully fully flourished language, so to say, you can say. An adequate language with, with a rich literature, with a, with a heritage of rich literature, you may think, like, like Indian, for example. See that? And uh, there what happens is you have got bilingualism, and uh, the author can, the writer can choose any one of these. So most probably because of to keep the imperial connection, they might they might prefer an imperial language. So that is the situation there. But you find that the the model is not adequate enough because or comprehensive enough uh, because it, it is not we cannot include the West Indian and the South African experiences within this within this circle. It is, not, it is very difficult. Within this grouping. We have already seen why. In West Indies it was a violent and disruptive process. And so the language was a language of disruption and, and division, so to say. Hate, hatred. It, it causes hatred, so, because of the experiences that these people had. And second, we saw in South Africa, you have got a black South African and white South African. White, white South African had all the qualities of, all the characteristics of American, Canada, etc. Canadian. Or like settler colonies. And the black, um, like Africans. See that? And the, again, you know, in, in South Africa, the whole thing was complicated because of the policy of apartheid. And then, second point to note here is that adequacy of the language. You cannot question the adequacy of the language because a language, just because it is transported from its place of origin, don't, don't, uh, like, we shouldn't think that the, the language has lost its, lost its uh, efficiency to describe places or to describe new experiences and a new environment. It can be violent or friendly, but still, and we have seen. So because of these two reasons, we don't, we don't reject it. We don't say that this is a, a very, uh, this is an unimportant model. No, this model also tells us a lot of things about uh, that uh, language, uh, how how a language functions or behaves, how a people, uh, influ how a people, uh, a group of people are influenced by foreign language, how literature develops in post-colonial societies and so on. So it, it throws light on many other aspects. Although you will find that there are two important points of this agreement. I hope that you have followed me, you are enjoying my classes on post-colonial uh, writings and all this uh, explanation of my explanation of discussing models and so on. I hope that uh, we will continue with it. We have got two more models like this, that one is dominated and uh, dominating and the other is colonizer and colonized. And after that we will see two more points like what are the thematic parallels in post-colonial writings. And finally, you will see uh, the how to name this post-colonial literature. Some people say this terranglia. Some people say this uh, colonial writings. So there are many names have been given. We have to fix at least we have to we have to choose one, and then we have to uh, call or name the uh, all the post-colonial writings by some name, that is what that we will see later. People will uh, say, Shakespeare might say, what is there in the name? But in this case, there is something in the name. You cannot say, post-colonial literature, you cannot say, a writing shaker, say, pre-colonial literature, that cannot be. Because when there is a post-colonial, there is a pre-colonial. And post and pre, there will be a dialectics. Understand? Some opposition or some similarities or dissimilarities. These things, Taking these things into consideration, we have to give a name. And with that, this this series of lectures will be over. So you can expect in our next classes, colonizer, colonizer, colonized, that is one model, then dominated, dominating, another model, 
They have got thematic parallels, that is the all fine, found in all postcolonial literatures. Then we will also see the name, how to christen this, give a name to this amorphous group of group called postcolonial writings. So hope to see you soon. Till then, bye bye.